My name is Ebenezer Amwako Entry, and you are so welcome to this YouTube channel. On this YouTube channel, you are going to get videos that will set you up in your work with God and also with your prayer life. On this channel, you upload videos consistently to make sure that believers are guided to pray and pray and pray. If you are new to this YouTube channel, make sure that you subscribe to the YouTube channel so that when we upload new videos, you can have access to them. And also, if you don't understand anything, kindly send us a message and we will get back to you. Also, make sure that this video you are about to watch, you will like the video, try and comment on it. And when you are blessed by the video, make sure that you share it to someone. Thank you. We give you praise. We give you glory. We exalt your name. We honor you, we love you. We say take all the praise, take all the glory. Thank you, Father, in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Father. Just allow that atmosphere to suck into you. Thank you, Father. Mm. Thank you, Father. We give you praise. Jesus' name. Amen. In the precious name of Jesus. Hallelujah. 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 people in truth until they come to maturity in the things of the spirit and in order to achieve that three things are cardinal 
The first is a robust priesthood. If all you know about God is all you read in a book, you don't know him. In the day of trouble, that realization will down on you. The God you read about in a book, you have to encounter him in the spirit. And that's why prayer and priesthood becomes too important. In order for this level of maturity to be attained again, we also need to imbibe the discipline of staying in the presence. That's why we take time extensively to worship. So that we get acquainted to the presence. That acquaintance in God's presence is what engenders transformation. And then thirdly, for capacity to be built, then we must journey deep into the word of God. Because everything that is ever achievable in God is achieved by the instrumentality of the world. And so, when you intend to see mature believers, you will take time and pay the price to go through the rigor of prayers, the discipline of waiting in the presence, and an in-depth journey in the Word of God. As I begin to talk tonight and bring us the Word of the Lord, if by any means you got tired in the process of prayer, or you became bodied, why the worship was going on, you will see why. It means there are places you need to journey to if you will be strong and if you will be, you will be relevant in God's agenda. Usually when you do this kind of business, you know you have to start with a few persons. I shared with you on the first day I was speaking in parables. I said when Jesus multiplied bread, there were 5,000 people. But when he ascended the mountains of Gethsemane, there were three. There's a place where you meet with the crowd. That's the buffet of God. Where you give out of his bounties. But when you want to see strong men, even Christ himself was able to have, raise only 500. But out of the 500, they took their word. And so I'm persuaded that if we continue on this journey, by the time we journey for six months, we'll have men here who have capacity to take cities. You know, when an apostle comes into a city, his strategy is different from that of an evangelist. An apostle can sneak into a city by night. And in the morning, he leaves with his bag. But you will hear the noise behind him. Because the people left behind will turn the city upside down. It's the strategy of Samson and the foxes. We know and we are persuaded that a generation will rise. Women that may appear feeble, but their stature in the spirit will be heavy. Young boys that looks as if they are just leading the ways of life. We journey so deep in God that their utterances will have weight to crack the foundation of a city. That is our body. And so tonight, even as we still attempt to lay foundations, I want to talk to us about knowing the Lord personally. You know, last week we began the series of the I Am. The reason is because looking through scriptures, like we earlier said, The stature of the man Christ, not the God Christ, is expressed in threefold. As a son, as a priest, and as a king. And I said to us that when a man becomes a son, a priest, and a king, God can either launch him out as a believer, he can launch him out as a prophet, he can launch him out as an apostle. Because at that time, he has understood the pathways of the spirit. And he has also developed stamina enough to bear the kingdom on his shoulders. And so the man Jesus attained the fullness of stature as a son, as a priest, and as a king. And you, so, you see, Jesus is the pattern man. And so the primary objective 
of ministry is to raise people that operate at that same stature that Jesus walked in. Because the goal was not just to come to reveal to us what man is supposed to look like. The goal is for every one of us to grow and become like the Christos himself. And so when Jesus was departing from the earth, the Bible said he left a token to the body. In Ephesians chapter 4 verse 11, he said that he made some to be apostles, some to be prophets, some to be evangelists, some to be pastors, and some to be teachers. And he said the goal is for the perfecting of the saints. The word perfecting is the word katadismos in Greek. It means to equip the saints with light until they come to the fullness of the measure of the stature of Christ. But we said in order to grow in Christ, there is a protocol that the scriptures reveal to us. You cannot grow into the fullness of Christ until you begin to behold him. Because it is in beholding him that you are changed. And so the job of ministry and ministers is to paint Jesus to a people so that they can behold him and in the process of beholding him, they will be changed. But Jesus himself understood that it's possible for a different Christ to be portrayed to a generation. And so when he was doing a quality assurance with his disciples in Matthew chapter 16 verse 16, he said, who do men say, I the son of man, I am. Because before I came, the prophet Isaiah prophesied about me 800 years ago. In Isaiah chapter 9 from verse 6, he said, unto us a child is born. Unto us a son is given. The government of this world will be upon his shoulder. And I understand when I came, I entered the synagogue, I saw some old men who are called the Sanhedrin, the scribes, the Pharisees, and the Sadducees. They were explaining some things from the Bible. They had the Torahs, the books of the law, and they were saying some things about the Messiah. And unfortunately, when I came into the tabernacle, the people who understood the Torah and were reciting it, they didn't recognize me. I thought the activity around the Torah was to present me. How come I walked into the temple and the doctors of the law that were reading the Torah did not recognize that all that the prophet said had appeared in person and they couldn't find him. So he said, who do these people say I am? Me, I have not sat down to listen to them, but I know you are their disciples at some point. When you were following them and they were reading the Torah, we're talking to you about Moses, Isaiah, and Jeremiah. Who did they tell you that I am when they saw me? And they said, some say you are Jeremiah. Ah, so you read the Torah for 800 years and the word of life showed up and you think it's Jeremiah. He turned to the other disciples. Who did your master before I came say I am? He said, they say you are Isaiah. He knew there was a problem. So he turned back and he asked a third time. Who did they say I am? They say you are John the Baptist returned from the dead. That means what they were doing with the Torah was the principle of incarnation. It's reincarnation they were teaching, not the Christ. He said, some say you are John the Baptist. And I said, okay, now that you have been with me for a couple of times, at least for a few months and a few years now, who do you say I am? So the question of I am was not just a theological question. The question of I am is to open the vistas of the spirit so that people can look upon the Christ and find him. And it's in knowing and finding him that they will grow into his fullness because we all with open faces beholding as in a glass the image of the Lord we are changed into that image from glory to glory so now I need to have a survey to find out if there is anybody that is able to open the vista and Peter by the spirit spoke he said you are the Christ the son of the living God so every time the subject of I am is considered the job is to reveal the true Christ so that the people that behold him we grow into his form. You know, when they were arguing with him in the synagogue, in John chapter 8, they were troubling him and troubling him, bringing theological debates. And he said to them, Abraham, your father, the one you respect so much, he saw my day and he rejoiced in me. And he thought by saying that, the people would say, wait, oh, hope, this is not the Messiah. They now looked at him and laughed in the flesh. They said, you are not yet 50 years old. How can you claim that Abraham saw your day? He said, what we are talking about is not chronology. What we are talking about is the foundation of reality. He said, before Abraham was, I am. They took stones and began to stone him. Because what they were reading in a book was different from who they were seeing. Every time I am is presented, is to reveal Christ to a generation. And you cannot have a true encounter with Christ until you have begun to know the I am. 
please, for those who are ministers of the gospel, when next you are coming, just help us. We, these seats are for you. If you are an ordained minister, when you come, please, you can just walk up and sit in the front. We may not be able to identify every pastor, but please, if you are an ordained minister, when you come, you just come to the front. Nobody will interrupt you. We want to be conscious to honor those who are laboring in this land. We came to support and to compliment what you are doing. So please, when next you come as a minister, you just introduce yourself to the ushers and they will bring you to the front. Praise the Lord. Hope you have not lost me. So when you present, I am. You are trying to open a vista through which the Christ can be known. And Jesus decided to help them. Because he knew if he allowed them to find him in the spirit, it would be so difficult for them. Because the I am have many tributaries. You know, when you want to enter this auditorium, there are many doors. There is a door you enter that brings you to the front. There is a door you enter that brings you through the back. There is a door you enter that brings you from the side. So it was important for him to show them all the tributaries of I am. So that when you want to find the Christ and have an encounter with him, you will know the channels to follow, to make the journey easy for you. He would have allowed the disciples to survey it, but it would take aeons. Because I am is beginning and end at the same time. And because he didn't want them to labor so much, he decided to give them seven windows. And the first window was in John chapter 6 from verse 35. He said, I am is the bread of life. I am. That means there is a dimension of the I am that you eat. You know, Jeremiah said, I found thy word and I did eat them. And they became the joy and the rejoicing of my heart. That means when you meet Christ, there are certain dimensions of the world that you don't hear. You eat it. If you are part of those who cram scriptures and quote, you are still at the kindergarten. Because when you meet I am, when you feed on him, you will gain strength. That strength will come into your spirit in the form of joy. You know, joy is not happiness. Happiness is of the soul. Happiness is orchestrated by circumstances. Joy is not pleasure. Pleasure is of the flesh. Pleasure is orchestrated by comfort and solace. But joy is of the spirit. It is a spiritual substance that is imparted into you that becomes strength. That's why Nehemiah 8 10 said, the joy of the Lord is my strength. So even if I go to the valley of the shadow of death, I can't be perturbed. I don't know how to be troubled. When you find a man like that, he has met a dimension of the I am. That dimension is called the bread of life. We will talk about it, not today. But Jesus told them, there is a dimension of the I am that gives you strength. That dimension, you eat it. You don't hear it. You eat it. The second dimension he gave them was in Matthew, in John chapter 8 verse 12. He said, I am the light of the world. He said, he who follows me will not walk in darkness, but he will have the light of life. So there's a dimension of I am that impacts you with eternal knowledge. A kind of knowledge that does not only furnish direction, but that kind of knowledge brings you into the center of God's will. So at every point in your life, you know what God wants. At every point in your life, you know what God is saying. You are never stranded. That's why in John chapter 5 verse 5, he said, he himself knew what he should do. There were 5,000 men that came and he had, and they said, give them something to eat. And these guys were walking with facts. They said, ah, even if you sell, you buy with a year's wages, you can't feed this man. Only men are 5,000. But the Bible said he knew what he should do. His knowing what he should do is not just informative. It's a power to solve problems. So when a man enters into the light dimension of I am, he becomes a solution to his generation. He may not look like it, but when there is crisis, that's where he manifests. You know, when you have not met light, crisis will intimidate you. When you see problem, you become weak. But if you have met the light dimension of I am, it is in problem that you shine. That's why we were not sent to church. We were sent into all the worlds because he expected that we should have encountered light. So when you see us, all Christians, all believers, stranded in the face of problem, it means there is a dimension of the I am that they don't know. Have you seen people going through problem and they say they are strong, the Lord is their strength? They know one dimension, they don't know the other dimension. The first dimension they know gives them endurance. But God doesn't want you to endure through the problem. 
there is a solution that is in that problem that will make you shine. So you are not only supposed to have strength going through crisis, you are also supposed to know what to do to come out of the crisis because there are different tributaries. If you don't know the light dimension of the I am, you will go through the problem for 500 years like Abraham. Abraham was barren. He went through the crisis for 25 years and he was strong in the Lord. But when the light dimension came, he knew it was not just enough to be strong. I need a child. And so light came and something happened. An offspring came out. We are exploring the dimensions of the I am so that your life can be complete. When your life becomes complete, you become God's battle axe. The kingdom can depend on you for advancement. You know, sometimes when we come to church, instead of helping people grow, we become the reason why they remain children. It's not all the time you prophesy to people. It's not all the time you pray for people to be healed. Sometimes you give them resources that makes them, instead of receiving healing, walk in divine health. So when the guy sees a growth on his leg, there is a light that comes into his spirit. And instead of looking for a pastor or an apostle to lay hands on that leg, he can look at it and say, the light shines in the darkness. The darkness comprehended it not. He can look at it and say, himself took away my infirmities. By his stripes, I was healed. It's not something he's trying to remember. He has mingled with light so much that something springs out of him every time there's a problem. For such a man, he's not looking for a superstar to glorify in the place of Christ. The Christ himself has become a living dimension in his spirit. Until a generation rises like that, we will still have miracle services and a hundred thousand Christians will go there. It's beautiful. But when the church mature, we won't need healing service. When the church mature, we won't need miracle service. Because men will not look for healing. They will walk in divine health. And the only time the church can come there is when everyone is guarded with light. And if we don't have light now, the devil will use sickness to distract us. That's why many people go to Babalawo for healing. Because they think sickness is an incurable infirmity. And when sickness comes, they are intimidated. If we don't bring men into light, poverty will make them turn away from God. Because when they try everything and it doesn't work, they will think it's all about solution. It's not just about solution. It's about who you have become in the Christ. And the only way you can come into that realm is when light begins to beam out of your spirit. The psalmist said, even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I look left, I look right, there's no hope. He said, but I'm not perturbed because I know that God is with me. What kind of light did he carry that made him so bold even in darkness? When you think he needs encouragement, you come to him. And he said, Abraham was strong in faith, giving thanks to God. You, you came to have compassion. When you looked at him, he looked at you. He said, no, I'm not in trouble. I'm basking in glory. You think it's a joke, but it's reality. That's the dimension of Christianity that can fight the battles of the ages to come. I am the light of the world. So Jesus is expecting that you need to encounter the bread to gain strength. He's also expecting that you need to encounter the light so that nothing takes you unawares. When they say there's a problem, he say when men are cast down, you will say there's a lifting up. Men are actually cast down. It's not pretense. But you know that there is a light you need to have that your word will make you rise up. So you are not crying for help. You stand up by speaking. He said, let no man in Zion say, I am sick. Why would a man in Zion walk like that? Because there's a light in him. That makes it impossible for sickness to append itself to him. Is the I am dimension of light. I am the light of the world. And then he went further. He said, I am the door. <laughs> That's what I want to talk about tonight. <laughs> you know, when an immortal is talking, keep quiet and listen. When you finish listening, tell him to help you to understand. Because you will think... What he's saying is English language. It's not Aramaic. He said, the words I speak, they are not for education. You may be educated, but beyond education, he said, the words I speak, they are spirit and they are life. So you may hear it and you say, ah, this and this and this is what he's saying. It's deeper than that. When you hear an immortal speak, you will still need to ask him, help me to understand what you are saying. Help me. What, what does this mean? You know, Jesus said, wherever two or three are gathered together in my name, and then you will look at it. You say, this is one, this is two. We can change the world. But you have done two or three gathered and you have not seen result. Because what? <laughs> no, I won't go there. If I go there, I will be lost. You know, in the spirit, numbers represent codes. Numbers 
are codes in the spirit. You can see one in the spirit and that one will mean 10,000. When one angel stands, one angel is equivalent to 10,000 because the code of the angelic is 10,000. So when you see one angel, one angel is 10,000. Jesus expects that men should have more stature than angels. And so when two men who believe in Jesus are standing, because two angels are more than 20,000, two men are not two. If you, st <laughs> if you study the Israel, the army of Israel, when the army of Israel was counted, God told them that, ah, this is an abomination. Because what David did when they counted the army of Israel is that they reduced their stature in the spirit. You don't count them by numerical value. Because Israel, the army, the army of Israel was 600,000 plus. The word Torah. Should I go there? The letters of the word Torah is 300,000. And the Jewish rabbi understand that every physical letter of the Torah has a spiritual backup. So the Torah is also 600,000. So when Israel is moving, Israel is not a number. Israel is the Torah. So when you count Israel in number, you have reduced their stature from the Torah to men. And if you do that, Israel will be defeated. So when Israel was counted, God became angry. You gave them a numerical value. They don't have a numerical value. They are they represent different things in the spirit. Sometimes Israel can become the Torah. Sometimes Israel can become a weapon. Why did you reduce their stature? By giving them a physical number. You are now vulnerable by your enemies. So a spiritual ritual must be carried out for that, that, that error to be corrected. So when Jesus said, wherever two or three are gathered, he was talking about stature. But if you don't understand it, you will just speak it by face value. When an immortal speak, hear him deeply. What he's saying is deeper than what you know. And so the third dimension of the I am that Jesus gave them, he said, I am the door. In John chapter 10 verse 9. And he began to explain to them what the door means. I am the door. He said, he that cometh to me, three things will happen. Number one, he said he will be saved. That means this kind of door is not just something you enter. This door is talking about his salvation. I can enter this door, I enter this room. But when Jesus speaks about his own door, when you enter, you enter life. You enter a place where you are exonerated from judgment. So that door is not just a space. It's a dimension that you come into. And the first thing you find in that dimension is life. Number two, he said you can come in and go out. What he was talking about is access to the presence. It's liberty. That means when you find this door, there is something that will come into your life. It's liberty. You know, in Psalm 16 verse 11, he said, in the presence of God is fullness of joy. And before he said that, he said, you will show me the path of life. For in thy presence is fullness of joy. So when he said, come in and go out, what he was revealing to them is the access to the presence. That means everything that surrounds God's realm, you will now have access to it. That's why when John in Revelation chapter 4 verse 1 heard a voice as of a trumpet, he said as he turned, a door opened in heaven. The moment he came into the door, what he saw was a throne. So the door was not a place, it was a throne. And he saw 20 and 4 angels bowing down and rising up. He just saw a door, but the door is government. The door is an eternal dominion. But what he saw in the spirit looked like a door. So Jesus was saying, when you enter this dimension, you come into the presence. And there are many things that happen in the presence. And number three, Jesus said, when you enter into this door, he said, you will find pasture. Pasture is reality. It's the depths of the word of God. The things that are encapsulated in the world. He said, when you enter this door, you will find it. You will find life you will have access to the presence and the dimensions of God and then you will have access to reality. This is how men encounter Jesus and begin to grow in stature because something opens to you and you enter and your life comes into a motion, a motion that may take a cycle of 10 years and then you are wondering what happened. You enter the door. Some of you entered the door three years ago and a hunger for fasting was activated in your spirit. And you didn't know that that door, the reality that was there, is to task your flesh 
until the ventilation of the spirit is quickened. You thought you just came into a place. You didn't come into a place. A time comes when maybe you come into a place where worship is going on. And as you step into the presence, all of a sudden, you become quickened. And then you enter into the realm of visions. And that vision puts a burden of intercession on you. And for four years, you are just interceding. You are wondering what is happening. God is teaching you a dimension in the spirit. You have come into the presence. So the door gives you access to participate in the economy and the politics of the spirit realm. You know, when I was teaching about life yesterday or Sunday, I told you many believers have not understood the protocol of life. Because the way we were raised, we think Christianity is about activity in church. Activities are very important. One of the ways you grow in the kingdom is by service. Service from a perfect heart. But much more than activities, Christianity is an activity of life that is happening in your spirit man. And if you are not taught to be sensitive to it, you can be in a congregation for 20 years, you'll still be a babe. Because you have not even learned the basics of life. I gave you a simple illustration. When a child is born, before that child understands the native language of the mother, the child knows some other languages that he or she is not taught, like the language of hunger. You don't need anybody to teach the child the language of hunger. The moment that child came out, it doesn't matter if your people are, are, are Yorubas. It doesn't matter if they are Igbos. Before the child learn Igbo and Yoruba with his or her brain, the child will learn hunger by reason of the life that he carries. And you will find that child beginning to look for what to eat. Who told the child that food enters the body through the mouth? There is another intrinsic educational syllabus that is, is, is weaved into the child because that child has received the animal life. That's the same thing that happens to you when you come into the spirit. When you receive Christ or you encounter Christ, the life, something happens to your spirit man. And that thing begins to quicken you in different dimensions. If your Christianity does not educate you that you need to pay attention to the sequences of life, you may never grow. Because for some of you, what life will do to you is that life will begin to judge you when you talk too much. You go out, you talk to your friends and you lose your peace. The Holy Ghost is not talking. Life is telling you the place where you are going is too far to talk like this. You are not a football analyst. Part of your destiny when you were created is that oracles were weaved into your soul. And those oracles are for a generation. If you talk like this, you can't grow. Because a point will come when every word you utter will be judgment over a territory. How come you can talk anyhow? So because life knows the sequence of your journey, life will begin to restrict you from talking. And you will think it's a casual thing. The reason is because you have not been taught the ways of life. You were just taught church activity. And then you are talking like that. You can go to the mountain for 40 days and come down every year. Especially on, from January 1st. When you do that for 13 years, you will discover that you don't grow by religious activities. Until you come back and obey the sequence of life, you can't go anywhere. Sometimes life will teach you that you can't eat anyhow. Because when I was credited into your spirit, they told me you are a prophet. And so I must insist that you starve the flesh until your senses are activated. And this one is between you and life. There's no teacher there to tell you, do like this, do like that. Every time you eat, you will lose your peace. And then sometimes for three months, you can't eat food anymore. You are hungry, but if you eat, it looks like sin. It's only in the evening you feel like eating. And depending on the kind of journey that you have been created to walk on earth, there are some of you that you can't even go out. There are some seasons of your life, life will bound you in your room. You can't see the sun. Every time the sun is shining, he wants you to raise oblations in the spirit. So that those, those rays will carry those walls into your territory. You know, in the dark supernatural, they understand this. Some of the astrologers that functions with the bond women, in the evening, you see them walking around your country. You think they are shoe shiners. Nobody survived by shining shoes. They need to enter the nook and cranny of the territory and they will speak into the rays. When they speak into it, when the moon is shining, the moon will travel with those oracles. Those are powers of astrology. They understand it. Some of them will wait. Few minutes to 12 midnight, they start chanting. Because when the new day is born, the wars they send into the next day will control how the activity of the next day is carried out. Because they are educated in darkness. But believers have no education. 
we are only used to church activity we are used to religious programming and life is shouting in your spirit but you can't hear I can tell you now if we take a census there are some of us that life has troubled us so fast for the past three months we have not been able to because we take it for granted so long as we make an appearance in church we think it's okay when they say you are blessed you say amen you will remain a child because there is something louder than the voice of the prophet that is speaking through your spirit you have not paid attention to it until you come back to align with those sequences you can't go anywhere the law of the spirit of life has eluterod me from the law of sin and death there is something that life does it brings you liberty from this corrupt world so that you can begin to live from celestial dimensions and bring government from the realms of the heavens to the earth realm that's why that same scripture that said the law of the spirit of life Romans 8 2 is the same scripture that said in Romans 8 21 that the endless expectation of creation 19 waited for the manifestation it is those who have been eluterod by life that can bring deliverance to nature I can assure you the reason most of us don't grow we're not taught to pay attention to these things we don't pay attention sometimes when life is telling you to fast you don't fast then you go and join a religious fasting and when you do that you come back and you think you have achieved something meanwhile they, they, they measure that is dictating it but you can't hear I am the resurrection and the life there is something I want to teach you that nobody understands because I was the one who created you in the studio of eternity I know the specificities that I weaved into your being and so when life is screaming at you you begin to pay attention and you begin to grow you do this for six months you'll be amazed that your growth level will be more than what you have done in ten years and then you are wondering how because you are functioning by an intrinsic reality and the same way Jesus tells us today he say I am the door when you come into me you come into reality you have salvation, you have intimacy, and you have reality. These three put together is equal to dominion. But there is a way it plays out. You know, when John entered that door, he came out and he began to write letters to churches. Because he has entered the realm where salvation dwells. He has come into an intimacy level so deep that the secret code of creation, he saw them. He has come to a place where he has taught reality. He said, if you read this book, you are blessed. I don't need to say you are blessed, that you are hearing it. You are already blessed. There is so much authority that he came with because he had mingled beyond the doors. He has gone beyond the veil. There were certain things John saw. He wanted to write it. They said, don't write this one. If, if, if men hear this one, they will become gods. So wait for those who can come this far. Because there is a level of authority you can't handle until you go far. And so when Jesus grants you access to the door certain things begin to happen in your spirit there are three of them number one is prayer because behind the door incense rise if you want to know the activities that happen behind the door when you cross the altar court to the holy of holies you are going to find the altar of incense when you cross to the the, the, the most holy place you are going to find the the mercy seat where the high priest enters with incense and pours the blood. So what happens behind the door is incense. The second thing that happens behind the veil is worship. The third thing that happens behind there is service. But this evening, because of where I want to go to, I will talk about the incense. The incense is priesthood. When a man is summoned into the door, there is something that is activated on his inside. You know why I'm saying these things? So that we know the dimension of Christ you are meeting. When you encounter Jesus the life, laws will be awakened in your body. Those laws will want to regulate your life. Don't sleep. It's not a doctrine. If you teach it, you are wrong. Because life will deal with your own specificity. When that life is quickened, it can tell you, don't eat four times in a week. It's not a doctrine. That life can tell you, pray for five years. You, if, you, if you go out and say until you pray for five years, you are not an apostle, you are wrong. Because yours is five years. Somebody else's home may be 15 years. Somebody else's home may be three years. Somebody else's home may be one year. It is life dictating to him. But when life is quickened, there is a law of life that is activated. The same way, when you enter the door, the way you know, you may not see a vision. You know, somebody called me two days ago and said, when I hear your messages, 
I hear you talk about encounters, encounters. And I've been praying for six months now to see angels. I said, what you are doing is called idolatry. You want to enter angelic worship. I didn't pray to have encounters. My walk with God took me there. Because I saw Jesus when I was seven years old with my naked eye. I didn't know what it, mean. it meant. Sometimes the vision you are looking for, if you see it, it will profit you. Because you may just see Jesus and he won't speak to you. He will just appear to you and go. The only thing it will do for you is that it will furnish a conviction in your spirit that even if there is a sword on your neck, you can't deny him. But how to grow, you may not learn it from that encounter. The first time I saw Jesus, he didn't talk. I was just brought up to the heavens and I saw activities going on. A woman carried a child and came to worship him and he sat on a throne like a king. I tapped my mom, look up! Before she turned, he closed. Till today, I don't know what it means. It was a prophet that came to tell me that no, it's you. God was showing you that you will serve him. I said, eh, amen. So those of you waiting, you want an angel to come out of your wall like this. Those are not the things that make men. An angel may come out of your wall and your whole gospel for 40 years will be how angels appear from the wall and you will not grow again. Everywhere you go to, you say, when I was praying for 21 days, angel came out of the wall. You now mentor a generation that will start praying for 21 days to see angels. You will raise idolaters. But when you encounter Jesus, sometimes it's in your spirit. It's an activity in your spirit. And when you find Jesus, the door, one of the activities that will be awoken in your spirit is priesthood. When you begin to tend that priesthood, something will happen. You know, the reason we are sharing this is because we want to see a generation that grows into the fullness of what? The measure of the stature of Christ. So it's not just about what you see and sense. It's about who you become on account of what you see. That's why every encounter you have provokes something on your inside. And when you see Jesus the door, there is a priesthood activity that will be quickened in your spirit. If you know, you will not quench it. You know many people have seen this dimension before. They said they went for a crusade and they were set on fire. They prayed for one week and they now mingled it with seasonal movie. And after two weeks, they think they were praying because they felt like that prayer, they wake up by 11 and pray till 3. They will now wake up by 11 and 11, 10, they will start yawning and sleep. That's when they will now realize that another energy was planted in their spirit. But they were not taught. They were not taught that these are the journeys of the spirit that makes men become ranking men. When this priesthood activity begins, there are, set, there are five layers of maturity that Jesus will bring you to. The highest layer is where Jesus himself dwells. I, was, I began talking to them about it yesterday and I said in my spirit, no. That's the message for tomorrow. You know, we're here praying for three hours yesterday and we had a great time. When priesthood begins, the goal is not prayer. The prayer is a vehicle to attaining unto a dimension in Christ. You know, the Bible said in Isaiah 66 verse 8, it said, as soon as Zion traveled, she brought forth her children. Because people don't understand this, they make a show and a pride of prayer. They make a show of traveling. The goal is not travel. It's what they travel in beds. You most times come to a place where people are praying, you'll find the most arrogant Christians. When they stand up to talk, you know these ones, they have not entered anything. They have just exercised their will and motivated themselves. Because when you want to see the travail, the impact of the travail of Zion, you'll find out the offsprings that Zion brought forth. Because the goal of travail is to bet. Have you seen a pregnant woman before who is in travail? Those are the most painful experiences in life. It will be pathetic for a woman to travail and end up with still bet she will not recover. But many times because we don't know that the goal is not just the travail, we now kill ourselves and make a waste of travail without bringing forth. When incense begins to rise in your spirit, you have entered a journey to a dimension of maturity. And so you begin from there as an intercessor. Now, if these things have not begun, you can go and learn the law of prayer of faith and apply it. It's good. This one I'm talking about. This one I'm talking about is about growth. 
You can apply the law of prayer of faith. The law of prayer of faith is simple. It's a prayer to the Father in the name of Jesus and don't doubt in your heart. That's how it works. So when you want to pray, pray in the name of Jesus, address the mountain, command it to be removed and don't doubt in your heart. You have your result. That's beautiful. But if you have encountered the door and incense begin to rise, what you are walking in is deeper than the prayer of it. Because that kind of prayer is no result. The reason is because where you are going to, all the problems pursuing you, they won't journey that far. You may start that prayer with high blood pressure. When you reach there, you will discover that there is a, an energy level where high blood pressure does not exist. So you, you don't need to pray for the high blood pressure. Just be traveling. You will travel to a place where you will find yourself before the sea of glass. When you bath in that sea, every infirmity will fall off. There's a place you will journey to. You will discover that there they don't pray for bread. That's where bread is created. So if you think of anything, it will happen. It's a dimension deeper than resort. It's a dimension of becoming. And when these things begin to happen, the first thing it makes of you is an intercessor. There are three things that happens to an intercessor. The first thing that happens to an intercessor, I shared with them yesterday, is that a battle against flesh is activated. That's why Jesus said when you bring a gift to the altar and you have an ought against your brother, he said leave it there, go and make peace. Because on this journey, it's not who can pray louder that makes the difference. It's who can surmount the obstacles that can go further. When you begin to journey the journey of intercession, you will kill the flesh because that activity in itself negates the operation of flesh. And you know, like I told them yesterday, flesh has three manifestations. The first manifestation of flesh is departure from God. We call it rebellion. That one looks harmless. When they say pray, you say, I don't feel like. When they say study, you say, I don't feel like. It's flesh at work. Because flesh is alien to the civilization of God. When flesh begins to walk in a man, he doesn't derive pleasure in spiritual things. Spiritual things are difficult for him. When he wants to do it, he's so hard, he can't. It's like a mountain. The second dimension of flesh is to break the ordinances of God. We call it iniquity. So when a man is growing in flesh, he journeys from rebellion to iniquity. At first, he thinks he doesn't feel like praying. At first, he thinks he doesn't feel like studying. Then after a while, he now starts feeling like fornicating. He now starts feeling like lying. So he will first of all depart from God. Then he begins to break the ordinances of God. Then the final level of flesh is antagonizing God. That's why I said the spirit is against the flesh and the flesh is against the spirit. The two are one against another. So flesh begins by departure then and then breaking the ordinances of God, then antagonizing. But when this incense begins to rise in your spirit, the first thing it will seek to do is to mortify flesh. So you will come to pray, you will discover that it will 30 minutes will look like 5 hours. Don't stop. Because what you are doing is that you are breaking the powers of flesh. When you come to pray, sometimes you stand up, it looks as if you want to die. You want to carry your pillow and lie down. Don't do it. All of those wounds, they are the utterances of flesh. Everything you feel like doing that time, that's what you shouldn't do. That's what Paul meant when he said, I beat my body. I bring it under subjection. It's on the altar you beat your body. You don't beat your body by slapping yourself. The way you beat your body is that you go against the protocol of flesh. Many times you want to pray. It looks as if if you stand up, your knee will break. Let that knee break. Sometimes when you are praying, it looks as if Kai did sleep. If you need to put your leg in water to pray, put your leg there. If you pray for a while, you won't need the water again. Something will be quickened on your inside and a new consciousness will be activated. Sometimes when you start praying, you want to sit down for two minutes. Refuse. If you don't sit down for two minutes, a point will come, you will now hear something. He said, the spirit himself helped our infirmities. The spirit himself subdues the powers of our infirmities. That's what the Bible said when he said, the Holy Ghost will mortify the deeds of the flesh. It's a product of the incense rising in your spirit. There are too many believers who are not taught these secrets. So they come to church and they celebrate during praise and worship. But when you say, let us pray, you will now discover they are not there. 
And the pastor is not concerned about prayer meeting because he doesn't want to raise men. If he wants to raise men, he will pay attention to the things that fight flesh. You can't be a leader if you don't, you are not part of the prayer department. What are you coming to do? What vibrations are you going to commit, communicate? How can you bring ministry to other people when yourself don't travel to where life dwells? You must pay attention and ensure that people begin to win the war over flesh. And one of the ways you do it is by allowing them to beat their body. You beat it in prayer. You beat it in intercession until a point comes when your flesh knows that it has to be buried because where you are going is far. It's an unnecessary garbage. When you begin to deal with flesh, then you enter the second layer of intercession. It's called alignment. Alignment is not just doing right and wrong from wrong. No. Alignment is threefold. The first is that you begin to pick signals from the realm of God. When you have tamed flesh, a point comes, you discover when you come to pray, then Jeremiah 33 verse 3 will be activated. He said, call upon me. I will answer you. But I won't stop there. He said, I will show you great and mighty things that you know not of. When a man has subdued the noise of flesh, he will discover that his prayer will begin to receive signals from heaven. Signals. Sometimes it comes as a vision. Sometimes it comes as a knowing. Sometimes it comes as an instruction. When those signals begin to come, you will discover that they will start energizing you. Sometimes you are praying and then a chant hits your spirit. You begin to chant that chant. It's signal from heaven. When your intercession does not take you beyond flesh, you will never know these things. And if you don't know these things, you can't take advantage of the realities that are behind the door. There is so much Jesus wants to bring us into, but too many can't travel. They can't travel. Some, the mountain of flesh stop them. But others go beyond the mountain of flesh and they enter the face of alignment. And alignment begins with signals. If I asked us here today, how many of us have prayed since this year began and received signals? You will discover where we are. We are still at the foot of the mountain. That's why you can be deceived. The Bible said, not being tossed to and fro by every wind of doctrine. When a man is tossed to and fro, it's because himself have no access to light. The reason people are deceived is not because they are fake prophets. It's because they are actually fake believers. Because when true believers rise, fake prophet will leave the market. That's why most of these fake prophets, they can't talk in minister's conference. You can gather children and tell them lies. A fake apostle can gather children and tell them lies. When he comes from minister's conference, if you tell him to give a charge, you say, no, I'm not in the spirit. Because he knows, dear, everybody is sensitive. If you want to bend the scripture, ah, sorry, wait, what are you saying? If you say you have seen a vision, you are not the only vision seer there. There are many people who see visions. And anything you say that is not consistent, they will find you out. We have fake ministers because we are fake believers. The Bible said in the last days, men will heap unto themselves teachers because they have itchy ears. If we begin to mentor people to pay these prices and grow, you will discover that most of the things happening in our in our society will die. It will die. And that's why many times people are not taught this truth. They make you feel it's okay. Somebody wants to travel. He needs somebody else to see and tell him the road is clear. What happened to your sight in the spirit? What happened to your knowings in the spirit? The Holy Ghost you receive, where is he? Somebody wants to give. The Holy Ghost can't move him to give. They bring a fundraiser. And then he uses scripture and manipulate it, manipulate it because he doesn't know truth. He now starts crying. After he cries, he now gives. When he goes back home, he starts regretting. Because he's tossed to and fro by winds of doctrine. When alignment begins to be achieved, even as the man of God is talking, you are checking in heaven. If the witness is not correct, you will pick it. And sometimes you'll be in church, you discover they can't minister to you. Sometimes you travel so high, even the person preaching can't bring witness from where you are standing. So he can't bless you. No matter what he says, you have gone too high. He will take somebody else that can fetch the oracles of God from that height to be able to bless you. Because you receive signals from heaven. 
The second thing that happens in alignment is that you begin to receive the burdens of God. It is in receiving the burdens of God that we are splitted into departments. Department is not a mechanical thing. Departments in the kingdom is a function of the kind of burden that you pick. So when we come into the kingdom, somebody else receives a burden for souls. He can't sleep anymore. God keeps reminding him of the iniquity in the society. So every day he wakes up. If he doesn't win a soul, he can't sleep. It's a burden that he fetched from the heart of God. Somebody else will receive a burden for prayer. And if you like, be doing praise and worship. You are wasting his time. He, he wants to fight in the spirit. He wants to fight. There is something troubling the heart of the father. He has peeped into those things. Those things will now determine the places where he can find comfort when he comes to the house of God. Because the burden he has is for intercession. Somebody else will receive a burden to see that the things happening in the house of God are in order. So when he shows up and things are not excellent, Kai, it looks as if the whole service was messed up. He will run helter skelter to ensure that everything is excellent. That's when you find people in their ranks. Because the kind of burden God puts on your heart is what determines your rank in the kingdom. It's not pastor coming and say, this one have a good voice. You may have a good voice, but the body you receive from heaven is intercession. You don't need to sing. Because God is not looking for good voices. If he was, the Bible said there are thousands and thousands of angels. 10,000 and 10,000. Some of them, when they bring their orchestra and they begin to sing, oh, you need to have, God needs to begin to catch people to heaven. You will see reality from a better plane. Sometimes when angels are worshiping, trees and things are receiving life. They are not singing songs. They are emitting glory. When a true worshiper begins to worship here, even the trees in this neighborhood will begin to receive life. Because what is communicating is not only for men. In the days where men had power, they didn't only heal the sick of men. I heard of John G. Lake when he's traveling, sometimes horses die. He commands horses to come back to life. Because eternal life has the power not only to deal with mortal bodies, it can address even animals. Those are the men that truly have power. They can talk to trees and trees will grow. I read of stories of saints of old where they go to pray. Even in dry season, every grass is green because of the presence and the life that they bring there. They carry so much of God that everything around them enters another economy that is deeper than time. It's only in the place of body that you can carry such things. And when you begin to do those things, men will know that this one is not a showman. This one is communicating something. The very passion with which he communicates it, you will know that this one is piping something from the heart of Abba. There are certain men that have these bodies, they can't see the sick. When they see the sick, they start crying. There is so much compassion. Even while they are ministering to the sick, you can feel it. This is not somebody exercising faith. This is not somebody trying to make a show. He can't tolerate people going through pains. He has touched the compassion in the heart of God. Because through priesthood, he journeyed that far. He could touch bodies. That man can pray for the sick for 10 years. He will not feel tired. Because that body is what's driving him. It's like a fuel. That was what happened to Moses. When that body came, he couldn't sleep anymore. A man could forfeit the throne of Pharaoh in order to save Israel. But if you don't know bodies, Christianity for you will still be business. When you begin to walk in bodies, then you can enter the third layer of intercession, which is warfare. That time God can bring you out to match up with spirit. You know, Paul said something. He said, we wrestle not against flesh and blood. There's a realm you come to. It's no longer about bread. God will tell you, this is the spirit that is causing divorce in Abuja. And then you begin to fight with that creature in the spirit. And then people will not even understand what you are doing. See, we are not in the same, we are not in the same realm. All of us may come to church. People are different. Why some are doing business with men, others are doing business with spirits. The only reason why they are in Abuja is because God sent them to come and stop divorce. Because the prince that causes divorce have entered the city. And so every night that man is fighting. And then you are wondering, what kind of prayer is this? Who is this that is praying? And I'm not seeing any physical result. He has gone out of time. For such men, they are participating with God in the realms beyond your realm. 
we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities and powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, and against spiritual wickedness in the heaven. You know, those were the things Jesus was doing while he was on earth. Before Jesus sent the disciples out, he said, I saw Satan fall like lightning from heaven. There are many men who are still seeing Satan fall. Because that which Jesus was doing, they have grown into it. When he said it's a door, he wants to bring you into dimensions. But unfortunately, many believers will bear the name Christian and leave this world and they will never participate in kingdom. It's when they get to eternity, they will discover that while they were on earth, there were deep businesses that many others were doing and they will wonder, what did I do with the Holy Ghost? What did I do with the name of Jesus? What did I do with eternal life? They dumped it and they only received things that money can buy. Intercession. It brings you to the place of victory over flesh. It brings you to the place of alignment where you begin to live from Zion. And then it brings you to the place of contention. The battles of Elohim, he recruits you into it so that you fight on behalf of God. The things that the devil wants to do you become the one that fight on behalf of God. The same way Michael showed up and said, the Lord rebuke you. Many men rises and they say, the Lord rebuke you. They can begin to address the princes that make leaders forget why they go to their offices. <laughs> Meanwhile, we gather, we are insulting the president. You are insulting the president. Our president is a useless president. No, sometimes it's not about the president. There is a prince that is standing there that no man can contend with. So even if you go there with the right intention, that prince can darken your heart unless somebody rises and is able to fight in the realm of the spirit. We are many, but there are no strong men. So today Jesus becomes again. There is a door that we must walk through. When you perfect the business of an intercessor, then God promotes you. You become a guardian. This is what Christianity is about. If all we have been doing is what Christianity is about, I assure you, we have no message for Dangote. We have no message for Mazukabe. We have no message for Carlos Slim. We have no message for Warren Buffett. If all we are talking about, this Christianity of gimmicks, our world will, will be taken away and no man will stand to say restore. When you perfect intercession, God makes you a guardian. A guardian is a quality control agent that God plants in territories. When guardians begin to rise, certain things will no longer be permitted in cities and in metropolis. You know, St. Patrick went to Scotland. And in the days of St. Patrick, we were told that people were afraid of sinning, even in their houses. Because a guardian showed up. He came with so much righteousness that people were afraid of sinning in their houses. Not because anybody is going there. Because of the man's presence, certain things couldn't cross into the territory. In Acts chapter 9 verse 4, Paul did not know what believers were about. He thought Christians were just people gathered in an auditorium singing and praying and he hated Christians. And he went to the elders and collected letters. He said, I want to go to Damascus. I heard that most of these Christians have gone to Damascus. I want to arrest them. I want to beat them and put them in prison the way I did in Jerusalem. And when Paul was entering Damascus, suddenly Jesus in his glory appeared from heaven. And he said, Saul, Saul, why persecutest thou me? Immediately nobody told him. He said, who are you, Lord? Because there is a realm of power that invades your territory or invades your, your, your atmosphere. You will humble yourself immediately. He said, I am Jesus whom thou persecutest. It is hard to kick against the pricks. He said, rise up and go to the city, you'll be told what to do. How can Jesus meet a man 
and send him to another man. Because the job of guardianship has been handed over to another man. And from verse 8 of that scripture, when Paul entered Damascus, Jesus now went and met the guardian and began to talk to him about Paul that he has entered the city. Go and deliver him. And Ananias was talking with Jesus. Why? Is this not the same person that collected letters? Meanwhile, how did he know? This man collected letters from Jerusalem that is coming to this city to cause havoc. So the moment Ananias knew, he shut all the gates in the spirit. That's why Paul couldn't enter. He shut the gate. Jesus had to negotiate with him. I know you are in your office, but I want to use this man for an assignment. And when he was convinced, he stood up and entered the room where Paul is and he said, Brother Saul, the Jesus that appeared to you on your way here have sent me. That's a guardian. We don't have guardians anymore. That's why unknown government can enter a city and kill people. That's why ladies are raped. That's why lecturers can manipulate things in the university and nobody can talk. There are no guardians anymore. Demonic entities are entering territories. When guardians rise, territorial integrity will be restored. Guardianship is so much lacking that even in families, things are going wrong. They will come into some family, they say, they are four ladies. They are not able to be married. And you are there. You say you are an apostle. They will come into a family, they say, every two, two years, people die. And then you are bragging that you are an apostle. You have not grown. If you enter the door, you will know what it means to secure territorial integrity. And because you are there, death will cease. Because a guardian has risen. This is not Christianity that you find in a buffet. These are the men that participate in the league of gods. They know what to do in the heavens to secure the atrium. Jesus was a guardian. And today, he has raised many more guardians. In Genesis chapter 18 verse 21, God said in heaven, I heard that the iniquity of Sodom had become too much. I want to go down and see. When God came, he couldn't go to Sodom. He had to pass through Abraham. Because Abraham was a guardian over Sodom. And God began to interact with Abraham. It was according to Abraham's terms that Sodom, the fate of Sodom was decided. Because God was in heaven, he didn't take any decision. I want to go and see. But for me to take a decision, I must find out the guardian that is in charge over that city. What does he think? And Abraham said, what if you find 50 righteous men? He said, if I find 50 righteous men, I will spare the city. And he was going, and God said, Kai, wait, what if you find 40? Oh, let my God not be angry with me. This is my job description. What if you find 30? Abraham stopped at 10 because he thought Lot was doing something. But obviously, Lot didn't know anything about true Christianity. He was just a businessman. You know, many people come to church for business. Lord, bless my business. Lord, bless my family. In the days of war, children will become casualties because there are no guardians. There are no guardians. It was Paul that said in Acts chapter 20 verse 29, he said, when I leave you, he said, grievous wolves will come into your midst. That means while Paul was there, a thief can come into that church. If Paul remained in Ephesus, a manipulator can come. We stay, we are shouting from our puppet, fake prophets. It's because there are no guardians. We are shouting, things are going wrong. We are not supposed to announce it. We are the quality assurance agent that should stop it. So some of the things we are talking to God about, God is asking us, where is your office? Christians are shouting every day, reporting things that they should control. Paul said, because I'm here, no wolf shall come. He said, but I'm afraid when I leave you. He said, grievous wolves will enter here because I can't find guardians. I'm seeing elders. I'm seeing deacons. I'm seeing apostles and prophets, but there are no guardians. For how long will families remain in darkness? For how long will territories remain in darkness? We pride ourselves by our church number. But when you weigh our stature in the spirit, you can't find men that can keep the gate. Because there are no guardians. There are no guardians. Not too many have entered the door. Their Christianity stops outside where bread is distributed. Their Christianity stops outside where stories are told. 
their Christianity stops outside where they are regulated by their appetite. But a generation will rise that cannot be bargained by bread and wine. These ones will be guardians in the spirit and they will say no to iniquity and the territorial integrity of cities will be restored. The powers of the ages to come cannot be wielded until guardians arise. I will not just be an apostle. I am not a preacher. I came to secure the borders of this land. I came to stand with guardians to ensure that the purposes of God find expression. It's not a calling for prophets. It's a calling for warriors. Men that can bear the burdens of Abba and decree the mandates of Zion. That's why I say unto him, a child is born. A son is given. The government of this world shall be upon his shoulder. He's talking about guardians. Higher. Guardians. Don't pursue fame. Don't pursue popularity. There are things more important than fame. He said, Epaphras is one of you. Nobody knew him. Paul had to introduce him to his brethren. But he said, the reason you are standing perfect is because the unknown Epaphras is still existing. I'd rather be a guardian over a city than be a popular man talking every weekend. Yet, I cannot change anything from heaven. You want to pray in the spirit for one minute? You want to say enough is enough for this babyhood Christianity? Guardians was rise. Men that keep the gates. You can align with the angels that watch over the city. You know the guardian over the north. You know the guardian over the south. You know the guardian over the east and over the west. And so when there are crises, we congregate in the spirit and we change things in the natural. Barakado Saka Ele Ariato Avoy the Kama Ragapata Susani
You didn't come here because you felt like it. You came here because you were led by the Spirit. Your steps were ordered because an army is rising. An army is about to be born from the womb of intercession and from the places of power, the secret place of thunder. An army is about to rise. And so God brought you here to cook you in the ovens of life.
around him. There are seven men that God wants to put his hand upon. Men and women that can bring government over territories. People that can establish the dominions of the heavens upon the earth. Some of you will begin to break tongues uncontrollably. Some of you will be slain by the anointing. Some of you, the hand of God will come upon you like fire. Right now, every one of you implicated by that utterance, keep us, bring them here, I want to touch them. Men that can bring legislation over territory, seven of them, Holy Ghost, find them.
because you are a lady. You are not disadvantaged because you are a man. You are not disadvantaged because you are young or old. You are not disadvantaged because you are educated or not. You are only disadvantaged if you refuse to walk through the door. The Bible says available to us now is the power of the ages to come. The things available to us today it's already more than what is, is needed to be handled. The power of the ages to come. We already have access to it. You just need to journey. Guardians will rise. Not men that take pride just in prayer. But men that will enter cadres of power and realms of authority. Christians are not religious people. There are people ruled by the Holy Ghost, giving expression to the superfluous dimension of deity. When we show up, we are divinity in manifestation because the God of heaven, Tabanakos, on our inside. Marakova had the You are mighty on your throne. 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 the value of time. I will not go to eternity and be a stranger there. Tell the Lord in the deep recess of your soul make commitments to Abba. That's why you came. And we usher you into Christ the door. We are true men are born. Warriors are forged. Keep us Oil is being poured on a lady and seeing a dimension of power and authority fall upon a lady. Ladies in the house, your heart open, receive, step into power. Step into dimension. Reality is locked up in region celestial. You are caught into it. Walk in it. Zuzo 
of the dimension that they hand you. When you receive Christ, then you come into Christ. Receiving Christ is a token, but coming into Christ is a journey. As you depart from this meeting, you will step into extraordinary encounters. Encounters that turn ordinary men great men. Encounters that turn charlatans to veterans. The atmosphere around your dwelling place will become the atmosphere of heaven. The things that contended with you before now, as you go back, you will command those mountains to go back. I bring you into dimensions of power. I bring you into dimensions eternal. You are on earth, but you begin to live from heaven. A little one will become a great nation. A small one will be a thousand. Not one of you will lack. Because you have come into the dwellings of light. Everything that you require in righteousness is released upon you. I cause, I cause every affliction that has made you a slave. Sicknesses of all sorts. In the name of Jesus, I command their stronghold to be broken in the name of Jesus. Walk in liberty. From today, you will have the experience that Christ himself had while he walked the earth. You are an overcomer. You are more than a conqueror. You are not a man walking in lack. You walk in abundance from today. In the name of Jesus, powers that have frustrated your Christian experience, I come against them by this rod and I decree let their tyranny and dominion over you end tonight in the name of Jesus go forward and prosper thank you father thank you father every seed you have sown receive a thousand harvest a thousand fold return every desire you have in righteousness I bring the life of God and I animate it by the spirit Grace, heaped upon grace. The Lord bless you. The Lord cause his face to shine upon you. The Lord lift up his countenance over you. The Lord be gracious unto you. The Lord name his name over you. You're going out and you're coming in is blessed. None of your steps shall slide. Everything that pertains to you is blessed. You walk on the open heavens from today. In the name of Jesus, the works of your hand are commanded to prosper. And everybody around you receive life. I cause death and I command death to go back. Nothing around your vicinity dies. Life dominates it from today. In the name of Jesus. The Lord bless you. The Lord keep you. The Lord preserve you. Your heritage is secured. Both in time and in eternity. So let it be written. So let it be established. In Jesus precious name. Please sit down for a moment and receive the announcement as we close. I hope you enjoyed this video and I believe that you were blessed. If um, you were blessed by this video, make sure that you click on the share button and share it to a friend. And also make sure that you like the video so that YouTube can recommend this video to other people so that they can also be blessed by the message. If you have any question, 
please make sure that you contact us and we'll get back to you. And also, if you are watching this video and you don't know Jesus Christ, ask the Lord and personal Savior. I want you to make that decision. Just contact us in the description. Call us and let us lead you to receive Jesus Christ as your Lord and personal Savior. And lastly, make sure that you subscribe to the channel and turn on the, that notification bell icon. Turn it on so that when new videos are uploaded, you can be notified. Thank you so much and see you in our next video and prayer section. Bye.